It should go without saying that Mega Man X revitalized the franchise, which is why I made an entire video saying it. Right as the Mega Man formula had worn a groove in the floor, a proper Super Nintendo reboot of the character, developed over several years instead of rushed out using reused assets, saved the brand from wallowing in its own repetition. Mega Man X was a fresh new take on the Blue Bomber that still holds up as an excellent shooter platformer. And so, naturally, about a year later, we would get a sequel made in less than a year using mostly reused assets. History repeats. Six months after the events of the last game, Dr. Kane has been tracking mysterious microchips bearing the insignia of the former Maverick leader, Sigma, and has now tracked their source to a desert factory, wherein our hero discovers remnants of Sigma's Reploid Rebellion preparing a second coup. On my first run of X2, I was surprised by how comparatively short the intro stage was. It's honestly kind of jarring. The first game's intro stage acted as a subtle but effective tutorial, teaching you the game's controls and mechanics gradually yet naturally so that the player doesn't feel overwhelmed right off the bat. Here though, you take one quick dash through a hallway and then are dropped into a boss fight with almost no prep time. I don't see this being a problem for people who have already played X1, and it is nice that you start with the dash upgrade this time, but it certainly isn't as effective or cleverly designed as X1's intro. But hey, shout out to this green biker dude in the opening cutscene who immediately dies. He is missed, I'm sure. For the eight main stages, it's your typical Mega Man spiel. A series of running, shooting, and platforming challenges through a themed environment filled with enemies, bottomless pits, and stage hazards. As with most other Mega Man titles, the stages are all defined by a unique theme or gimmick, such as weather generating orbs in Wire Sponges stage, or rapidly rising lava in Flame Stags. These beetle enemies in Stags stage can also be jumped on and ridden to take you to higher areas, and even tricked into breaking open paths to hidden goodies or upgrades. Overdrive Ostrich's stage introduces the Ride Chaser, a high-speed hoverbike that can plow through enemies, and mastering its acceleration and jumping is key to acquiring a heart tank. Magna Centipede's stage sees the player evading spotlights to keep from triggering the security system, as well as falling blocks that can help you progress but also instantly crush the player if they're not moving quick enough. One stage in the final gauntlet even has these Mario 3-style moving platforms that change direction every time you jump on them, which seems a bit derivative, but we move. Ride armors return from X1, but here are given the ability to hover, and drill arms for breaking down walls, both of which will be needed to find the X-Hunter room in Crystal Snail Stage. The Maverick fights, likewise, are about what you'd expect. They're all fairly challenging one-on-one -on -one matches that are rendered completely trivial when using the boss's correct weakness. As is tradition. Bubble Crab remains tricky whether you use his weakness or not, as he just gets really annoyed when you use the wheel against him. So here's this giant enemy crab. Attack its weak point for massive damage. Magna Centipede's tail will be blown off if you hit him with the Silk Shot, which keeps him from infecting you with the Maverick virus. And while Wire Sponge's weakness doesn't have any cool secondary effect against him, it will result in him being chopped in half upon death, and that's a pretty nice touch. Wheel Gator's fight, though, just turns into a wall jump spam fest as you wait for him to emerge from his murky water, and while it makes sense for the Crystal Snail fight to be slow, I'm almost never a fan of bosses where the enemy is straight up invulnerable for a majority of the fight. Such a thing almost never feels fair. Luckily, the spin wheel can do some extra damage to him even though it's not his actual weakness, so that helps out a little. I also liked how Morph Moth had two distinct forms, one as a larva and the other as a full-fledged moth. It not only makes full use of the boss's design concept, but it was cool to see the usual desperation phase of a boss's attack cycle be accompanied by such a distinct physical change this time. Unfortunately, the only remnant of X1's interacting stages mechanic is seen on the world map screen, where Flame Stag's defeat will cool the volcano, and Wheel Gators will reduce his tank to rubble. In addition to the usual eight stage bosses, we now also have a mini-boss squad, which acts as this game's replacement for X1's interconnected stage hazards. Where X1 would, for example, have Flame Mammoth's stage freeze over once you defeated Chill Penguin, X2 instead has three new enemies known as the X-Hunters jump from stage to stage once X defeats any two Mavericks, and they can be confronted anytime X enters the stage they currently inhabit and locates their hidden room within. The X-Hunters are a nice addition to the story of the game, each one having a somewhat distinct personality considering how relatively little they're actually seen on screen. In the Japanese version, they each had a different manner of speech as well, but the English localization made almost no attempt to adapt this other than keeping each one's varying text speed. 
The Axe Hunters have reconstructed the body of Zero, but still require Zero's control chip in order to fully activate him, and so they plan to destroy X so as to more easily recover the chip from Dr. Kane. Each of the three X Hunters can be defeated to recover a piece of Zero's body, and so as well as the usual boss weakness order that's to be expected from a Mega Man title, the secondary decision making this time all comes down to whether you want to rebuild Zero or not. You better make the decision early though, because it's more than possible for the game to make the choice for you. Should you enter a stage where an X Hunter currently resides, and yet fail to locate them before you defeat the Maverick, that Hunter will be gone for the rest of the game. Likewise, while you can shuffle the X Hunter's current locations by entering and exiting a stage over and over, if the number of remaining X Hunters surpasses the number of remaining Mavericks, it becomes impossible to defeat all three, as they won't show up in stages that have already been cleared. While completely optional, going out of your way to recover Zero's body parts will allow you to skip a somewhat difficult boss fight against a Zero clone in the game's final stretch. So yeah, the central conflict of this game's plot essentially exists to justify bringing Zero back from the dead, and this makes sense when you consider the character's initial intent to literally be the new Mega Man. Keiji Inafune was much more involved with the planning and writing of the Mega Man X games as opposed to simply designing the characters and he really wanted his new favorite to become a mainstay, even going so far as to prohibit any drastic changes to Zero's look without his express approval. And as for our Dr. Wily stand-in, Sigma also makes a return from beyond the grave to act as our big bad once again, because in the Mega Man franchise, the status quo is paramount. The actual fights with the X-Hunters are a pretty mixed bag in all honesty. As well as battling them in the Maverick stages, you also fight them in the final stretch of levels before the final boss, making for six total encounters. The Swordsman, Agile, doesn't give me much trouble in either encounter, but the other two are a different story. Violin doesn't change much between his two fights, he's just slightly more aggressive in the second one, and his flail is easily the worst part of it. There's no pattern to the thing, no sense of timing to memorize, or even any real cooldown to speak of. He's just gonna fling that thing around with no rhyme or reason, and screw you if you can't manage to hit him, I guess. Sergis's second encounter can be cheesed with the right weapons, but his first one is awful, as he spams projectiles and hides behind a barrier that makes his window of invulnerability basically impossible to ascertain. It doesn't matter if you can actually see the barrier or not, because whether you can hit him is almost completely random no matter what. While I'm on the subject, there's a popular theory that Sergis is actually a cybernetic Dr. Wily, or is running a program heavily based on him. And while Inafune has refused to confirm nor deny this rumor whenever asked, the sheer similarity in their designs is enough to convince me personally. A fourth and female ex-hunter was planned for the game at some point, as well as a more unique second fight for Violin, but these were cut due to time and tech limitations. The X2 dev team was told to showcase the new Capcom Consumer Custom Chip, aka the CX4, which could be used to render and manipulate 3D wireframe sprites natively on Super NES hardware. Violin and the fourth hunter presumably would also make use of this chip, but after using it to create two boss fights near the end of the game, as well as a flashy bit in the intro cutscene, I guess the team was too pressed for time to make anything more. The soundtrack, here composed mostly by Yuki Iwai, has quite a few standouts. Flame Stag's theme is quintessential Mega Man style, and so it's surprising to learn that the composer didn't plan on using it in the final game. It was only due to overwhelmingly positive reception from the rest of the staff that it was kept, and I'm thankful for that, let me tell you. Similarly, the ending theme was originally written to be the Sigma Virus theme, but it was decided that it better fit the final cutscene, and I'd have to say I agree. Overall, the music is more varied than X1s, and I like to think that having so many uncommon Maverick inspirations, like snails and crabs and moths, led to such a diverse collection of themes. Crystal Snail's stage in particular really struck me in how uncharacteristically low-key the vibe was for a Mega Man game. I really enjoyed it. As with every new entry in the Mega Man series, X's roster of weapons this time is completely unique. The Speed Burner is a favorite of mine mainly for its charged version, which acts as a fiery forward dash on both the ground or in the air. Bubble Splash's charged version slowly drains ammo over time, but acts as a barrier that deals damage to incoming enemies, which is something I always really appreciate in these games where you constantly have things flying at you. 
Magnet Mine can be steered as it flies, and when charged up it can even increase its own size by pulling in surrounding projectiles, which also serves to keep said projectiles away from X. Silk Shot is a particularly gimmicky weapon in that it can gather debris when charged, sometimes even affecting the properties of the weapon itself, and in certain rooms will even summon health or ammo refills at absolutely no cost. Useful for filling up subtanks if you know where to go. Strike Chain is a little underwhelming. It can latch onto walls, but even its charged version is limited in use and difficult to aim. With enough practice and patience, though, it can be used to get the arm upgrade in Wheel Gator's stage. Normally you're expected to use the Air Dash or Charge Speed Burner to wall jump up this shaft here, but with the right timing and positioning, you can manage it with the chain. X's armor upgrades from the first game return in new reconfigured forms, each one granting a completely new bonus trait or ability than they did before. The body armor upgrade now only reduces damage by one instead of by half, but to make up for this, it builds up energy whenever X is struck, and once full, he can unleash the Giga Crush, a devastating screen-clearing move that sounds like the name of a Digimon attack because it literally is. The new arm upgrade retains the weapon charging capabilities from X1, but also allows X to stock up to two of his standard charge shots and unleash them whenever he wants. The head armor no longer allows you to break blocks, since now the spin wheel can do that, but instead allows X to scan his surroundings for interactive elements or hidden passages. This can be used in conjunction with the silk shot to find those hidden energy and weapon refills I mentioned earlier. And finally, the leg armor. Since X has the dash by default this time, a much appreciated change I'll say, the leg upgrade now grants him a mid-air dash. Unfortunately, I never found much general use for this outside of a few emergencies, since it can't be used following a dash jump, and the charged speed burner accomplishes essentially the same function while also doubling as an attack itself. Due to a programming oversight though, the leg armor can be used to skip on the surface of water. At some point in development, they decided to change the leg armor ability from the splash jump to the air dash, but whoopsie, they forgot to remove the splash jump capability when doing so. So, the leg armor just has two functions now. Bug or feature? You decide! There's even a secret endgame upgrade just like in X1, this time with much more lenient requirements. You still need to collect every upgrade heart tank and sub tank, and now the zero parts as well, but you don't need to do something ridiculous like play the same stage four times in a row or something. Just get to the second to last level and find this hidden passage, and assuming your health is full, you'll find the capsule. It's another Street Fighter move, this time the sure you can. It still requires you to be at full health to use, but it's no longer a guaranteed one-hit KO, this time instead dealing damage on every frame it makes contact with an enemy, which when done well can usually result in an instant KO regardless. It's more technical to pull off and requires a bit more practice, so while not as universally useful as the Hadouken, it's especially great for making anti-air assaults, such as against the rematches with Agile, Flame Stag, or Morph Moth. While I don't doubt there are quite a few fans who may cite Mega Man X2 as one of their favorites, I don't think it quite holds up to the original game. While the X Hunters are an interesting new gameplay twist, and not to mention started the trend of these games having optional bosses and alternate endings, they don't really make up for the absence of X1's interconnected stage gimmicks, which felt more dynamic in comparison and added a real sense of cohesion to the game's setting. It did double down on the storytelling, which some may appreciate, but on the whole, it didn't really do enough to elevate itself above its forebear. And after X1 did so much to innovate the classic Mega Man formula to pull the franchise out of its years-long rut, it's more than a little disappointing to see its sequel fall right back into the trenches of the classic series' copy-paste tedium. Like, quick, without cheating, can you tell me whether this is Launch Octopus's stage from X1 or Bubble Crab's from X2? Trick question, it's Toxic Seahorse's stage from X3. For crying out loud, the final level with Sigma literally reuses the first section of Magna Centipede's stage for some reason. It is overall a solid game, though. Its only real penalty is that I wish it did more to stand out. I can still confidently recommend the game, and we'll see if future games in the X series can manage to truly wow me the way the first one did. Because, at least as far as the 90s go, there was always another Mega Man game on the horizon. Oh, how times change. <laughs>